Joe here, Psychedelics Today. This episode is Kyle and I talking about the episode we did with Dimitri Michanis and, you know, just some commentary because there was a lot discussed in that show, some politically charged, some, um, you know, really interesting stuff. So we got into it and tried to dig out some nuance from that conversation. There's a lot of stuff that's really kind of difficult to discuss in this field, you know, race, politics, class, opinions on which way research should be going. Is research the equivalent to medical treatment? Should it be? Um, Dissatisfaction with the medical system and how research has to operate. And inherently in the psychedelic research, uh, we feel like we're doing this research a second time unnecessarily because of all the work done in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So there's just frustration in our field. We are mad about it. We're mad that we have to deal with the federal government and then maybe there's some infighting. You know, whatever. Infighting's fine. We just need to keep moving forward, spreading the knowledge, um, democratizing access in some way. Now, Kalindi Ayi says that mushrooms are the perfect thing for this field because they're so um, easy and cheap to grow. And, you know, one purchase of spores or culture, and you can keep it going indefinitely. So, you know, it's like $20 once and you can grow everything else at your home for really cheap on waste products. So I think maybe that's the solution. We don't really need to be bringing if we're getting frustrated about the field, then perhaps we just democratize and educate ourselves on how to treat people in our communities, our friends and family in a more peer to peer way, like group therapy or something. I think there's still a place for professional therapy and for the medical model and for all the research that's happening. But there's a lot of points we need to keep discussing, keeping on the radar. And that's enough about that. We recently launched a psychedelic self-care class on Teachable. And we passed out a bunch of free um, access to it. If you're interested in taking the class, let us know. Uh, We're probably going to close down access to it for now and make a nicer version, a more fine-tuned version based on the feedback of the people who are taking it now. And we really appreciate everybody that did sign up for our mailing list to get access to that. And if you want access to future free offerings like that, webinars, etc., do sign up for our mailing list, please. You can you can find it on psychedelicstoday.com. You'll see the the sign up form. And uh, you know if you follow us on social media, you'll probably see it as well: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that fun stuff. We're all there trying to. Stay in touch. Ooh, another thing about the class is that we're trying to be interactive with comments. So we'll be there, hopefully daily, responding to comments that you all leave in the class. If there's anything you guys would like to hear from us or you know have us develop classes, do let us know. I think it's um, important we get your feedback. And... Um, <clears throat> then we can really dig in and, and develop some stuff you like. Anyway, enjoy this discussion between Kyle and I, and uh, let us know what you think. Psychedelics today, email at gmail.com. And uh, if you forget that, there's also a contact form on the website, and we read that too. Thanks for listening. We really appreciate you guys spending the time you do with us. Have a great day and enjoy the podcast. Bye. Dimitri is a notable figure in the Ibogaine world. And if you haven't heard of uh, Dimitri before, just a little background. His relationship to cocaine and heroin and methadone lasted for about 20 years. And in 2003, Dimitri s- sought out an Ibogaine treatment center in Europe, initially he planned to return to his ancestral home in Greece to die after the treatment, but the Dubuiti and Iboga had other plans. Iboga ended his dependency to drugs without withdrawal and started him on a journey of spiritual and emotional recovery. In 2011, Dimitri was arrested by the DEA 
In an effort to bring the medicine that healed him with those without access, he attended approximately 500. He attended f- approximately 500 underground ibogaine ceremonies and traveled to Gabon, West Africa, to become initiated into the Buiti. In 2011, Dimitri was arrested by the DEA in a sting operation using paid informant. After a legal battle, he was convicted with reduced drug charges. This experience was a impetus for co-founding the Universalist Buiti Society, a state-registered religious institution. After six visits to Gabon, Dimitri opened a center in Costa Rica, Iboga Life. In addition to his work as as an ibogaine detox facilitator, performing hundreds of ibogaine treatment ceremonies with desperate people, he currently works as an outreach counselor at the New York Harm Reduction Educators in Harlem. His innovative group, We Are the Medicine, is propelling the conversation about spirituality and drug use. So just, yeah, that's a little bit about Dimitri. It was really fun to talk with him. He brought up a lot of great topics. Uh, We kind of dove into some of the shadow side of uh, the psychedelic work. Um, We dove into topics of like race and culture and privilege. And, you know, Dimitri is a firecracker. He brings a lot of energy. And I think he's... He spoke about a lot of things that might not be said normally in this field. And I think it's important to highlight, you know, the race and privilege thing just because, you know. It's an underrepresented discussion point. And, you know, I'll come right out and say that sometimes I think the arguments are are made in a weird way. I, I do think that yes, uh, people, all sorts of kind, all sorts of people need this kind of medicine and help, but you know, is it, whose role is it to make sure that the, the research program is, is like helping people. This is, this is research this is really preliminary. Unfortunately, like, uh, where I agree with Dimitri is we, we, are, we know this stuff works. We have plenty of, we have decades of research that shows it works and it's safe. Um, and why aren't we using it? Uh, uh, it Dim, one of Dimitri's criticisms that we got into is like, um, why, why aren't we having the people of color represented in these studies? It's all people with higher ed degrees. <laughs> and from you know white backgrounds white privileged backgrounds and uh Catherine and I we got into that when we talked to her a little bit and uh you know we got into it more here but it's you know whose responsibility is it is it the responsibility of the researchers to to include diversity as part of their research you know perhaps um you know maybe it's not going to work as well or maybe it works better for those diverse populations we don't we don't know because we don't have that data we have data from we have data from Soviet Russia, but we don't necessarily have data. We don't necessarily have data from Baltimore, you know. <laughs> uh, right. But what what were, what were your thoughts on the interview? I I thought it was awesome, and I I really hope a lot of people listen to it. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm really interested in just like shadow work in general, and maybe just mm-hmm. that's because it's part of my background of like kind of. I'm interested in death and I think death is a shadow topic to begin with. And, um, I think to help move some of this forward, it needs to be talked about in a conversation. It needs to be expressed. And, you know, sometimes I think it might, you know, rub people the wrong way, especially maybe those who are doing the research. And I, you know, I, I kind of bounce back and forth between like, I get it because like I'm a student and I want to propel this research and um, I get that we have to follow certain guidelines and procedures if we want uh, these medicines to become legal. And but, you know, I'm also kind of carrying that other torch where I'm like, but, you know, it should be accessible. I mean, especially something like this, um, you know people that are suffering from addiction, they don't have thousands of dollars to go to Costa Rica or go to uh, British Columbia where these medicines are legal for treatment. 
and you know it, 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 it i guess it touches me because i know a lot of people that use substances that necessarily might not be able to afford the treatment and you know there's a lot of people out there dying right now there is a huge epidemic with heroin and um like the fentanyl that's going around you know i've had people in my life die and it's just it it, it kind of stinks that yeah some of the research isn't there and um yeah so it, that that makes me think like uh this is research how is a 30 person trial going to help anybody to any meaningful degree right especially if your home life might be a little rugged or something mm-hmm. i think they want to pad their stats in the research by knowing that somebody's going to go home and you know maybe they'll be able to go get a, afford a massage or something or take three vacation days whereas the other population won't really be able to do that uh, right and maybe that's a, a long-term strategy to be able to sustain the research for longer mm-hmm. you know i don't know i don't know the reasons i'm sure a lot of these researchers aren't aren't necessarily racist uh, they could be but I, I don't know but you know they're not picking I, I don't necessarily yeah, I necessarily don't think they are. I think yeah. it's just hoops that we have to jump through right now. And, um, you know, maybe a lot of researchers do feel this way about, like, affordability and, um, you know, opening it up to other populations. But maybe just where the research is now, it's just, maybe it's not possible. I don't know. And maybe it just kind of comes back to our belief system and whatnot. But Yeah. Um, How do we want to operate in the future? Do we want this thing to be hypermedical? You, you have to check into a, a, I don't know, a licensed medical facility of some kind to do this treatment, uh, which which then you know, excludes a large portion of the population from this kind of therapy. Or do we want to figure out how to legalize it and include it in the medical system and then somehow from there further democratize it so that communities of people like, you know, uh, psychedelically informed AA could help each other? Something like that. Um, it's kind of kind of huge questions. Yeah, it really. is. And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Um, <clears throat> we want these things to be used uh, as necessary. I think yeah. we, want, we want everybody that's suffering to be able to get access to this stuff. Mm-hmm. Some people think that by getting it in the medical system, it excludes by necessity excludes a lot of people. And I, mm-hmm. I don't necessarily feel that way, but it, it's true. You know, I, I personally don't know what it's like to be super poor and without insurance. Right. You know, I, unfortunately, or, or fortunately, <laughs> mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, as Dimitri says, I, I still have suffered maybe just uh, very differently <laughs> from, uh, right. you know, other populations. Right. So what else did we get into? Um, a little bit about some of uh, his background going um, to Gabon and using Ibogaine and running underground sessions until he got arrested. And um, yeah, it was it was a lot about the Ibogaine treatments, a little bit of a history. And then I felt like we talked a lot about, you know, the racial and uh, diversity stuff a lot and mm. like potential research and maybe where where it's going in the future one thing he brought up that i think we need to raise later probably is psychedelic uh gaslighting right yeah and uh yeah how people in uh positions of power over their patients or or clients or whatever um use these phrases that really disempower the patient Mm -hmm. so you know like oh you just weren't able to let go enough right you know just trying to out oprah each other stuff like that (laughs) yeah something that kind of came up when he was speaking you can just tell like how authentic dimitri is and it's almost as if like his work with the medicine just speaks through him um and you know i think like sometimes we do get these like big messages of like radical change and maybe some of us are afraid to speak it because maybe some of us are currently in the system working um to help move this uh movement to help forward this movement in a new direction and we have to work within certain parameters um but you know I, i've definitely you know through breathwork sessions and stuff i've had some pretty radical views come up and uh 
you know i think that's the shadow side you know and we do need to do deep analysis on what it is we're doing and Mm -hmm. a lot of that isn't contained in our day-to-day understanding of stuff so yeah stuff like shadow work or or as dimitri put it structural analysis needs to happen Mm -hmm. um for us to really figure it out and uh perhaps everything we're doing you know i i feel like a lot of the the danger scary language really puts into the terminology like an end point i don't i don't necessarily want to believe that there is an end point more than everything is is kind of like a piece of software it's iterating and improving over and over again so there's no real utopic situation it's just everything including how we can distribute this stuff is, is going to gradually improve over time Right. And I think that's why it's important to have this conversation because it's just offering the conversation to the community and to the professionals. And if you are a professional or a student listening, um, you know, maybe you don't agree with some of the stuff, but, you know, just kind of take it as an open mind because, I mean, these are problems that are that are coming up and, um, you know, I don't know. I talk about we talk about in like the counseling field about like uh, equality and like cultural diversity diversity and stuff like that. And, um, you know, I think this is a perfect example of it. It's like, you know, here's some of these underserved populations and, you know, maybe they're not getting served with the best treatment. And here's a, here's our potential medicines, because I think like that's where some of the work needs to be done. Not saying that these underserved populations are broken, but, um, you know, they're just, they're trying to better themselves. And, you know, part of the, sh- the system and the structure just doesn't allow them to move forward. And maybe we have tools that will help them move forward and get a different understanding on where they're at. But yeah. Another part of the shadow work that I don't think it's talked about enough is inflation, psychedelic use and inflation. So mm. Your personality or ego or however you want to phrase it gets changed for a while after psychedelic use. I, right. I don't necessarily know about MDMA, but uh, psilocybin LSD, classically the case that you can, you can have some runaway inflated stuff going on for you for example um we uh, the example from breath work is always you run out of the session and need to, need to tell everybody the good news on the radio station that, <laughs> yeah. about how amazing breath work is or that you're the messiah or something like that but there's you know that's the most extreme example but there's other uh gradations of that too and that's mm-hmm. something i think maybe not all of us pay attention to Mm. Um, when you go to the forums online, you can see a lot of that stuff playing out. <laughs> it's just out- outrageous. Um, and I, I, I don't know that it really happens in conferences all that much, but, but some of the opinions being presented are coming from that inflated place. Right. Um, so right. Being like, you know, rock solid centered on a uh, well-considered opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So something to keep in mind. I don't know exactly I don't necessarily mean anything by that, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're hearing people in the psychedelic world talk, take a second to analyze, you know, how far outside of center they are. You know, I, mm. I totally agree with Dim- Dimitri's opinion that a lot of stuff is broken. Tons of stuff are broke is broken. Right. But, you know, how do we address that? I don't know. I'm not the one with solutions. Um, right. I do. I do think that we have a lot of work to do and I don't mm-hmm. necessarily think, the U.S. federal government is the one to do it, but, you know, we, that's the system we have to kind of play with to get, you know, a permission to be adults. Right, right. Yeah, and I think that's maybe partly why this, why we're doing this project is Absolutely. just to, like, maybe raise awareness and just start a conversation. Like, that's that's all it's really... It, is about for me is starting the conversation um, to think about some of these things as they start gaining legitimacy. Yeah. As they become legit. You know, I just, there is an article today that just got published about another LSD research and language. Um, That's really cool. And you're seeing it more, more and more. Yeah. It's just to keep the field growing and moving and evolving. And we need, we just need conversations and different opinions because not everybody's going to agree on, you know, 
one thing. As a human that cares about other humans, you look at the way science is progressing in the psychedelic world and you go, what the hell are they doing? Why would yeah. they not talk about language when they could actually be fixing people? You know, <laughs> that, that's a very similar argument. Like the, the race one, it's like, what are you doing wasting those resources not helping people that are suffering? Mm -hmm. That's kind of like a like a classic Christian or leftist or whatever kind of kind of approach to that that situation. But science has its own kind of agendas. Different different verticals inside science want very specific data points to help them understand their problems. Right. Not necessarily wanting to help everybody. But right. well, maybe in the long run helping everybody, but this you know, this language bit might take thirty years to be implemented somewhere. Right, right. I guess like what kind of, you know, I guess it's just where we're at. But, you know, Absolutely. a lot of this research is, has already been done before. And it's not that there's no data to prove. It's kind of bullshit that, that we have to do it again. Yeah, that it's just like you're jumping through hoops and it's like, wait, no, there's data that exists. And I think like, you know, maybe that's like part of it. Maybe that's like where Dimitri's coming from. It's like, wait, you know, this stuff, this stuff has been done yeah. in some regard. Why aren't we helping people and why aren't we making it like accessible to people that need it instead of we have to jump through these hoops all over again. Um, and it's like, who knows how long that's actually going to take, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, you know, as adults, do we really want to ask this large entity for permission? And that, right. I think that's more his point. Like, just if we could help people right now, why aren't we doing it? Right. It's, it's really a, kind of a scary conversation to have if you're a doctor or a licensed <laughs> therapist or something, because that puts your credentials at risk. Yeah. Um, and the credentials are kind of a big deal or a tenured professor somewhere like they can't have... Well, it's it's dangerous for them to have divergent opinions that that might put them in you know, legal controversy or something. Yeah, and I get it because that's somebody's livelihood. You know, you like you've worked all that time, and it's yeah. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I get it from both sides. Is what I'm trying to say, yeah. and I think that's why it's such a hard conversation to have because mm -hmm. you can see it from the different uh, sides and it's just, it leaves you with so many questions where it's like, okay, it's all out on the table now. Like, what do we do and how, how do we like move forward with it? So all that said, I think Dimitri is one of the more impactful underground therapists now retired. <laughs> don't, don't ask him to do that stuff. You know, maybe he'll point you in the right direction if you're obviously an addict, but uh, don't, <laughs> don't try to get therapy from him in the future. Uh, but I, I think he's had a huge impact on the psychedelic world by showing this different attitude. We don't all have to be PhDs to have an impact in the psychedelic world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, perhaps it helps and perhaps it would be the most impactful life choice for you to have a PhD, but you don't necessarily need it to help a ton of people and have a huge impact. And his, right. his group, we, was it, we are the medicine. Mm hmm. That yeah. check out some YouTubes on that because that's pretty incredible. I, I looked, uh, I watched a couple and was very impressed with what's going on there. And mm -hmm. by by enabling people and kind of redefining recovery, redefining what addiction, how you how you relate to people with addiction, like treat them like mm -hmm. real people, real humans that you know have a heart <laughs> and care yeah. about other people too, you know yeah. that kind of stuff. And then enabling them to actually have tools like you know complementary alternative medicine stuff where they can actually go help others suffering yeah it's amazing yeah Th and that's what makes me like think he's like so authentic it's almost like this like warriorship mentality yeah. um you know he's just out there doing the work and i think that's just absolutely amazing and he hasn't stopped <laughs> yeah i mean even like i think down. most people would be like i don't know if i'm gonna do this after like getting arrested and whatnot uh but you know he's approaching it in different ways he's in it seems like he has integrated his experience and then he's moving it forward in a different way you know he's not always focused on ibogaine's uh treatment and whatnot i mean he's you know, working with the harm reduction model, working in the needle exchange and offering ceremony in different way, sound healing. Like he, he's, he's doing so many great things and he, he's on the street helping people. And I think right. that's, it's, it's amazing what he's doing. And the one aspect about bringing traditional usages back into the modern therapy, therapeutic context. So bring it, I began over here and then actually treating it 
as if it was a traditional plant medicine ritual in Africa. So using the same instruments, using the same singing and, and, and ritual context, uh, you know, perhaps that's more helpful than following the traditional protocols we use right now for our research. So, right. So that's cool because it sets the precedent that, oh, look, he's been doing it this way. It's not, you know, Bach on the couch. It's, you know, drumming, singing, like high energy environment. That's right. As opposed to just a little bit more sterile. Like I like, right. I like the modern context, but yeah, I think we, but, I mean, he, time, he, we'll, invo- we'll, we will evolve it. Right. And, you know, he mentioned, you know, he, he if when he was doing it, he did work with a medical profession because of that one time that seemed a little risky. So, I mean, you know, I don't think he's totally against it, like the medical aspect of it. You know, it's helpful to have maybe a, a nurse or a, a medical professional there to make sure. I mean, especially when you're dealing with like people coming off of substances, you just have no idea how their body's going to react. And it's important to kind of have that medical structure there as well yeah yeah cool so um i think we've done plenty (laughs) as a way of build up um yeah one of the most charismatic and high energy people who really when i saw him at horizons forever ago really kind of changed the way i looked at the way people can do therapy this way Mm -hmm. yeah i hope everybody enjoys the show yeah And and uh tune in again subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, tell your friends, maybe follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Yeah. Leave us a comment, leave us a review, give us some feedback. We want to hear your thoughts. A ton. Reviews on iTunes are gold. Yeah. Or maybe some speakers that you would like to hear, an interview. Or questions. Reach out. Questions. We're trying to do this for you guys. So if you want to know stuff, let us know. And we're actually looking at doing some trainings on integration and uh, self-care stuff like that to help you guys figure out um, new ways you might want to relate to the field or develop yourself Mm -hmm. yeah and without feedback we don't know which way it's gonna go so you know we hopefully count on the listeners to help this project evolve and so feedback reviews anything helps us will help you hopefully all right thanks for listening guys take care